Okay, the next important property of static fluids is buoyancy. We'll talk about how to calculate the buoyancy of an object. This is described by Archimedes' principle, and we're all pretty familiar with buoyancy, right? Objects float because they are lighter than water. Objects that are heavier than water sink. Um, but that doesn't really answer why. So if you take a basketball and you hold it under water, you can you feel quite a bit of force pushing, trying to push that water, that basketball out of the water. What's the source of that force? Where does that arise from? And, and an even more difficult thing to explain is if you take a bowling ball and you hold it in air, it's pretty heavy. But if you wade into a pool and hold it while it's underwater, that bowling ball is suddenly a lot lighter than it was. So what is, what is the force holding that bowling ball up, even though the bowling ball is heavier than water, right? Well, this arises from our pressure prism. So think about our pressure prism, and that pressure increases with depth. If you apply that pressure to our submerged object, pressure always acts perpendicular to the surface, you could come up with a pressure envelope around that object. And what you see is that that pressure envelope is unbalanced. It's higher at the bottom than it is at the top due to our pressure envelope. So the force of buoyancy is the net force from that pressure envelope. We can calculate it using Archimedes principle and it's numerically equal to gamma of the fluid displaced times the volume of the fluid displaced. So for a completely submerged object, that turns out to be the same as the volume of the object itself. But if an object is only partially submerged, you have to remember to just use that submerged portion in calculating the buoyant force. Now we often think about this, we often don't separate weight and buoyancy, but mathematically when you solve these problems, you have to think of them as two separate forces. There's the weight force and there's the buoyant force. And that's why a bowling ball you can calculate how that that total weight or, or that total downward force is reduced when it's in water because the weight is still the same but now you have a, a larger buoyant force trying to hold it up. Okay, the weight of an object is gamma times the volume of the object and this is gamma of the object now. If we look at an object that is just suspended in the water column there, the force, the buoyant force equals the weight. And if we expand those, it's gamma V times gamma V. So we've got the gamma of the fluid and gamma of the object. And if it's completely submerged, those are the same volumes. So they cancel out. And what we're left with is this relationship between gamma of the fluid and gamma of the object. If it's if it doesn't float or sink, those have to be perfectly balanced, right? But this comes back to what we we know we knew in the very beginning that objects that are lighter than water float and ones that are heavier than water sink. So it's this comparison between gamma of the fluid and gamma of the object to determine which force dominates. So I'd like you to keep that in mind, but also remember the origin of that force and it co all goes back to the pressure prism. Okay, so Archimedes principle is that equation and that is in the FE handbook. A um, couple other details, buoyancy always acts upward in opposition to gravity and it always acts on the centroid of the submerged volume and we call this the center of buoyancy. Now we've got a couple things to keep track of now. We've got the centroid of the object, we've got the center of mass where gravity acts, we've got the center of pressure where the resultant pressure force acts, and now we have the center of buoyancy where this buoyant force acts. And there's a little detail here, sometimes or often actually the center of mass and the center of buoyancy are not the same place. And we could talk about different types of equilibrium with this. If we look at this egg-shaped object that's heavier on the bottom than the top, we've got the force of buoyancy and weight in opposition, but the weight is shifted downward because the object is heavier on the bottom half. This, as drawn here, this object's in equilibrium. Forces are balanced. If I disturb the object a little bit, 
now the, f the forces are no longer balanced. There's a net moment, and what that moment does is it puts the object back to the position it was in before. This is termed stable equilibrium. So it's equilibrium, and not only is it at equilibrium, but it's stable because it, it corrects itself. Here's a, the same object, but in a different orientation. So it's heavier now on the top than the bottom. Just as drawn, this is still in equilibrium. It, that object will not move as it is. But if it's disturbed a little bit, you'll see the moment that forms around it, it will now force it to spin over. That's called unstable equilibrium. And this is a bad situation if you're designing boats or other things that rely on floating. Um, and I did this example with completely submerged objects, but this gets more complicated with things that are floating on the water surface. If you remember, the force of buoyancy acts on the submerged portion of the object. So looking at this kind of rectangular barge, the weight might act right in the middle somewhere, whereas the force of buoyancy is below it. Um, as this object is disturbed, you can see the force of buoyancy moves around quite a bit. Um, as designed, this, is, this actually turns out to be a pretty stable situation. Um, but you can see that designing boats is, is quite complicated due to how this force of buoyancy can move around depending on what portion of the object is submerged. Okay, so let's do an example. Let's find the load a helium balloon can lift. So we've got a balloon with a specific volume. Inside it, it's filled with helium at a certain pressure and temperature. And the weight of the balloon itself, the fabric of the balloon, the basket, the ropes, is all 100 newtons. So I'm going to balance forces in the vertical direction. We've got our force of buoyancy, which we just talked about. So the balloon is filled with helium, and that's immersed in a fluid. It's, a, it's in the air. Remember, gases are fluids as well. So there's a buoyant force from the air holding that balloon up. Um, there's the weight of the balloon itself. And again, this is just the fabric and stuff like that. Don't forget the weight of the helium, the fluid inside that object. That also contributes to the weight, and this is easy to forget. Remember, when we solve these numerically, we have broken apart the buoyant force and the weight force. You have to consider them independently. And then finally, there's the lift, which we're solving for. <clears throat> okay, the buoyant force is, we can use Archimedes' principle. It's gamma of the fluid displaced times the volume displaced. Gamma is rho g. If we look up on the front cover of our textbook, gamma for, or rho for air rather, is um, 1.23. This is at standard temperature and pressure. We plug that in and we can get a value for the buoyant force. The weight of the helium is a little more complicated. It's gamma of the helium times the volume of the balloon. Gamma is rho times g. Now I didn't give you the density of the helium, but I did give you the pressure and the temperature. So we have to go all the way back to chapter one and think about the ideal gas law again. If we know the pressure and temperature, we can calculate the density of the gas. Uh, we need to look up the gas constant for helium. That's also in the front cover of your textbook. And then we rearrange the formula and we can solve for rho. Remember with the ideal gas law, there's a couple tricks. One is you have to make sure you're using absolute pressure, which is what you were given, but you, uh, there was a kill us, so you have to add a thousand to it. And you also have to use temperature in degrees Kelvin. So 15 degrees Celsius, you have to convert that to Kelvin before you can plug it in. Okay, so now we've got, we can use that to solve for the weight of the helium itself. And now we've got all our forces. We do our force balance and solve for lift. That gives us a lift of 555 newtons.